Good morning, guys. So, um, how's the project going? Are you guys ready for demo number one? Yeah? Okay, that's good. Alright, um, so today we're actually going to talk about something kind of related to demo number one. And I didn't put this before your first demo because I want you to figure out what technology you want to use. But in this chapter, which is chapter six, we are actually going to talk about just specifically JDBC and how, when C works with it, which I just assume you know I know so we'll make the project in C. All right. So um, we will still talk about this chapter. I was debating whether to talk about it before because now I feel like this, te uh, this textbook is relatively old and a lot of technology or a lot of packages you guys are using now is really different from this. However, I think a lot of big picture ideas still are the same, so we can still take a look at this and you can see what um, you have to take care of when you're working on your project. Okay. So in chapter six, chapter six we call the database application development. We will talk about how we connect, um, basically we are doing on demo one, uh, connect the front end and back end when developing an application. Okay. So yeah, we will go back from NoSQL, back to SQL again. Okay, NoSQL, that was all the three lectures that we offered NoSQL. Okay. So for this chapter, um, these are the things we will look at. And the first part will be SQL in application code. So I'm sure you guys are all really familiar with SQL right now. So we are just basically showing you how it looks like when we put it in an application. So, so far we are only doing SQL in terminals, okay? but I'm sure you guys already started to like interact it with your front end. Okay? So in this chapter we'll talk about it. And there are different ways that we can put SQL in action with our application. So one part will be called embedded SQL, which will directly put um, the, the SQL in the host language, which we will talk about later. So it allows us to access data using static, uh, static <coughs> SQL queries in the application code. That would be for embedded part. And we'll also talk about, we'll spend some time on the concept of cursors, um, which actually we're mentioning NoSQL, but we didn't mention it in SQL. Okay. So far we haven't learned about cursor in SQL. But this will come in handy when we, um, when we develop application. Then we will talk about dynamic <coughs> SQL. So dynamic SQL basically means we can create the queries at runtime which I'm sure you guys will be using a lot because um, your application, your project will not just be, okay, I designed these queries and all the values are already fixed there, so I, I have come up with all the scenarios. It must be like you need to take the user input or it depends on the timestamp at the current time, stuff like that. Okay, so that's for the dynamic SQL part. And then we will also talk about JDBC, which I think last time when we were doing the project phase one presentation, some teams mentioned we'll be using JDBC. So we'll talk about what's the architecture of JDBC and how it actually works, what it is. Okay. Then later on, we'll get to SQL, SQL J and store procedures, but that's kind of later part in this um, chapter. So let's get started in SQL in application code. So today, everything is kind of laid back. Okay, We are not going to um, solve any problem, everything just kind of I'll talk through and you guys think about why it makes sense, why it's designed that way. Okay, so this chapter is a lot more relaxing compared to the other ones. Okay, no more coding in this one. So um, SQL and application code. SQL commands can be called from within a host language program such as C++, Java, or Python. Okay, so that's what you will be using to design your overall system. The language you use other than SQL, or if you want to use no SQL, okay? So, back then in the textbook, they only talk about C and Java, but yeah, I think it's kind of outdated. Um, and I, I've seen a lot of you have uh, already using Python to do your project. So SQL, com uh, SQL statements can refer to host variables, which means that we can have variables in our host language program that we actually want the SQL <coughs> later to take in to use, okay? So this includes special variable used to return status. So later on we'll see whenever we have some errors from SQL, we can also catch it, okay? And it must include a statement to connect to the right database. So I'm sure you guys already know that in your program, when you design for demo one, you will need to somehow establish the connection between your application and the database, okay? 
So um, there are two main uh, approaches that we can put our SQL with our application together. So the first will be embed SQL in the host language. Okay, so this will be the approach we, we commonly say it's embedded SQL. So I think you guys, uh, I'm not sure which, which one you guys use, but for embedded SQL, it's basically saying you directly have the code that exactly looks like what we do in SQL. When we learn about SQL in Chapter 5, you exactly put it into um, what is it? Uh, your host language program. Okay. Then another approach will actually be creating special application programming interface, so which is the API we, we talk about all the time. So instead of directly putting the SQL code embedded into our host language program, we use API instead. Everyone knows what API is? Yeah. Okay. So all right, so when you think about coding in SQL and then having your application actually coded in other language, a lot of times one of the biggest problems that will occur is you will actually be handling different data types. What SQL returns is not guaranteed. The language you use would definitely catch it, right? Sometimes they have different understanding of data types. So we call this the impedance um, mismatch. And one of the scenarios you can think of is a lot of times the SQL returns multi sets of records. Right? We say multi sets it's because a lot of times in the commercial MySQL it actually allows duplicates, but that's the, what the multi sets mean. If removing multi, that means no duplicate sets. Right? So quite often they will uh, return the multi sets of records, and in your host language that will not be supported. A lot of times they cannot understand directly sending in a table. Right? So this is actually where um, cursor comes in handy. So SQL supports cursor to handle the mismatch between SQL and programming language. Because the biggest difference between SQL is all of the answer it returns is table, right? rows of answers. So sometimes you might want a cursor to help your host language to iterate through what rows you're talking about. Okay, so we will get into a bit more in what cursor means later. So let's discuss the two approaches separately. Okay, the two approaches are the embedded SQL, which we directly put in the SQL code in our host language program, and the second approach will be creating API. So let's start from embedded SQL. So embedded SQL, really intuitively, we will just put our SQL in the host language program. So what happens when we do that is actually like this. So our preprocessor will convert the SQL statements into special API calls. Okay? So you don't really need to look into any APIs. You just directly put the SQL code embedded into your uh, program. doesn't matter how you do it. In C, we will show you how it looks like later. And um, if you do it in Python, I think sometimes you can just directly send it in as a string, which is writing the query and then sending the SQL comments as a string. Okay? Then a regular compiler is used to compile the code. So, um, throughout this chapter, whenever we talk about example, even though it's a quite old practice, but the example will all be illustrated in C. But I think the big picture still shares the common thing. So you can take a look at here, a couple of things that we might want to do when we do embed SQL, maybe in C, right? So the example here is in C. Will be maybe we want to connect to a database, so you will say execute SQL connect, or you want to declare variables, then you will need to, to give it a section where you put variables. So you will start by saying execute SQL, begin, <coughs> declare section, and then execute SQL, end, declare section. Or you might have some statements, which are like the queries we do a lot of times in chapter five, okay? So that'll be put here. So let's take a look at an example. For example, right now, if we want to um, declare some variables first, then in the C program, you can do this. You just start by saying, okay, here are um, the variables I want to declare, and then just put them in, and following the normal way that you would declare variables, nothing fancy. Okay, later on, I'll show you how the whole thing will look like in a complete um, C program. Okay. So the bottom two are just um, something, uh, how to say, something special about using C. 
and connect, um, communicating with SQL, but actually all of the other programs will have this as well. It's just basically taking care of errors. So normally, the way SQL can communicate with the host language will be maybe sending back uh, a value like that's like a state, okay, or an error, error code. So you can understand what it means by looking up the documents. Okay, just different, different um, host language will have different kinds of variables taken care of. So remember earlier we were talking about the mismatch between SQL and C. So a lot of times SQL returns the answer as tables, okay? Then actually C or other language might not be able to directly take in the input as table, okay? So that's why we will need cursor. So what cursor means is that um, we can declare a cursor on a relation, which is a table, okay? Relation is a table. Or a query statement that generates relation. So then the recursor will take care of iterating through the answer. So a cursor allows us to retrieve the rows in the table by positioning the cursor to a particular row and reading its contents. Okay. So you might have a query that says, um, that specifies some criteria that leads your cursor to a certain row of the table, then the cursor will be the one pointing there, and then C or other host language knows which data you're actually talking about. So what happens whenever we use a cursor is actually that we will first open a cursor, which I'll show you later, and repeatedly fetch the topple. Okay, say you have a lot of rows you actually need to, need to use. Then you repeatedly fetch it and move the cursor until topples, all the topples you want have been retrieved. Okay, so this is just a very simple idea of why we will want to use the cursor. I'm pretty sure in other host language you guys use are also using cursor. Have you guys looked into it? Like when you put, okay, who has done to, like you can put a query and then get result back? So what did you guys do? PHP. PHP, so did they, did they involve any cursor or just directly displays it all? Yeah, we just um, we get all the data and then we convert it to JSON. All you convert it to JSON. <coughs> I see. And then, and then PHP renders the JSON? Mm -hmm. oh, all right. So that's another approach then. All right. So let's let's take a look at what we will do for cursor. So cursor, the cursor can move to particular rows by specifying additional parameters for the fetch comment, which we will show later as well. So in C, okay, still imagining if we are you know, interacting with C between C and SQL. Um, so you, using fetch, you can actually fetch. Um, the values that's returned from SQL and then store it into the variables in your program, okay, which I think you guys will do a lot as well. So the queries access through a cursor and can control the order of tuples returned by using order by. Also, I think uh, some of the teams are already displaying the result in tables. So maybe you will have the um, function of sorting the tables in some sense, right? Giving the criteria saying, I want to sort this by the product's price, I want to sort this by um, how many days left for the bid, okay? So we can also use order by. Mm -hmm. Let me see. So here are just a couple of things. So for order by clause, uh, we know that uh, the variable you want to order by must be included in the select as well, which is very intuitive. And also, yeah, nothing fancy here. You just, um, yeah, you can order the answer in the post language. So here would be one of the examples for ordering, okay, which we are all really familiar with. So let's say we want to get, let's say in our database, we are again store the sailors, boats, and reserves back to what we are familiar with. And let's say today we want to get the names of sellers who have reserved a red boat in an alphabetic order. So inside here, it's all what we learned before, right? For the SQL statements. And putting that execute SQL declare s info cursor for, it's actually showing we embed this whole thing in our host language program. So uh, right here, we actually declare this whole chunk to say what this return will be put in a cursor. Okay, so that's how we use the cursor. And then we order it by the S name. And just a really little note, note that because we didn't select maybe say SID, then we should not order it by SID because it's not returning the cursor. 
So when doing the order by, just make sure you have it, um, the order by the thing that you have selected. Okay. So um, a little bit more on cursor. So here I ask, we usually need cursor for select and do not need it for insert, delete, and update. Why? Yeah? Because the select, you're going to do it like a lot of times with the same data, but the insert is probably going to vary and delete, maybe? I don't know. Mm -hmm. So for the cursor, it's also serving for the host language to know what data it gets back. Mm -hmm. so, okay. Yeah. So William, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was just going to say select is giving you data back, but it's going to data is changing. Yeah, exactly. So that's the answer. So because they do not return tuples back to the program. Okay. But there will be other types, okay, like some special cases where we actually need that um, because for others, for other actions. But in general, we only need it for select, okay, because select is the one returning topics. Okay. So here will be an example of the embedding SQL in C. Let's talk about what actually happens here. So you can also map it into your own um, host language that you use. For example, at the very top, you see we declare a variable, which is SQL state, which is the one we said earlier. It will be able to be the one storing whatever state the, the SQL part returns. Okay. Then here, we start by saying here, we start by saying we want to execute SQL begin declare section. So for these three lines, here's the part we were declaring the variables, okay, like we said earlier. So in this chapter, I won't ask you to remember the commands because everyone has their different ways of using their own host language. As long as you know the big picture, okay, then that, that's fine. Okay, so here we start by declaring section, declare a section, and then we put the variables we will later want to use, okay, and we finish declaring it. And then later, right here, we actually give a C min rating, okay, we, which we just randomize whatever number there is, and then right here, which we will use later, okay, and then right here we start a whole chunk right here that's for the cursor. And what happens in the cursor is here, we do select from where, as we are really familiar with, right, in SQL. And you can see here, we have, we want to select the sailor name and age from the sailor table where the sailor rating is greater than the seaming rating. And here you can see we have a colon. And in C, that's because we are specifying this variable comes from the whole language program. So if you just execute it alone, then it will actually not work in SQL. Okay, so this is just specifying. This comes from um, there. Okay. And in this program, what it's actually doing is just to, to keep fetching information. So you can see from here, we keep fetching the information and put them, again, right, we have column, put them into the CS name and CH that we declared earlier, all right, and using the fetch because then this will match, map, to here and the A will map to the H. Okay, we just keep fetching in and then simply print it out. Okay, so this is what the program is doing. They simply print out um, the name and edge we, we fetch and each row. Okay. When will we stop? So here, different um, state code means different things. So if you have state code right here, it just basically means we have more we have more row to fetch. Okay, so we do. Uh, as long as the SQL state is still like that. And then we stop when the SQL state changes, means we don't have any rows left anymore. Okay, so that's what the whole cursor here is doing. Okay, so here I said this, uh, yeah, that's for storing the values returned from SQL, okay, to the host language, and then the whole thing, just a whole chunk of, um, we use the cursor to go to all the qualified topics. So nothing fancy about this program, but then you can see how it's actually working when we have SQL and your host language um, program communicate. Right? Starting out, 
by declaring whatever variables we will need, and then we start this chunk, and we embed the SQL comments in there. And you can refer to the variables you actually declare in the host program interactive with your SQL part, and you can also fetch back the values returned by the SQL part. So for this kind of approach, when you can correct, uh, directly see your SQL commands in the program, then we call it the embedded SQL. So remember earlier we were talking about, like right here, even until here, for the C uh, min rating, it's generated right here. So it's not really <coughs> dynamic, <coughs> but a lot of times in our application we will actually need whatever criteria or values that we will be using have to be dynamic because maybe it will be a user input, okay, or maybe it will be the current time. So um, that's what we call the dynamic SQL, right? So for dynamic SQL, what we are basically saying is that <coughs> SQL query strings are not always known on compile time. This allows construction of SQL statements to be on the fly, okay? So what do we mean by that? Here will be an example. So let's say we want to do dynamic SQL in this scenario. We started out saying we store some um, SQL strings into the variables, okay? And right here, it will do, um, we will prepare it, and then from the SQL string, and then execute it when you're ready. Okay, so you can actually store different kind of SQL strings and they will change it. Okay, you store it as a string, just a just, uh, character array, and then they might change. You will be able to modify them throughout the program based on different conditions, different needs that you want. And you first prepare it, but you, you don't execute it. So you only execute it whenever you feel like it fits what you want at the moment. Okay, so this, this can be dynamic. So you don't have to directly embed it first. You can prepare it first. Okay, so the string can change it up um, based on your need. So as you can see, because we first store um, the SQL in a string first, so the, the SQL command is actually prepared at runtime, right? You only run it, uh, you can only know what it is when you're running it. So this sometimes will incur some runtime overhead. Okay, let's say your design is very complicated, um, your criteria set for the SQL string is really complicated, and that might cause some runtime overhead. So, so far, what we have learned about is the first approach of interacting, let's say, the front end and the back end. Okay, so that's the embedded SQL. But, um, actually, there are some drawbacks for embedded SQL. So that's why we need the second approach. Okay. So here we say there's a problem with embedded SQL. Even though the source code can be compiled and work with different database management systems, the final executable usually only works with one. What we mean by that is um, maybe your program you want it to be able to interact with multiple database management systems. Okay? So if you write it that way, when you embed it, it can only work with one. For example, uh, maybe your, your program you want it not only be able to work um, to communicate with a MySQL database, but also an Oracle or Microsoft, different kinds, even though they're all SQL. But maybe you want them to interact with different types, different versions. So if we do it in the embedded way, as you saw, we have just hard-coded what we want to do in the host program, okay? So if you change it up to different kind of database, uh, database management system, then we will not be able to use it. So for embedding SQL, this kind of approach, we call it very database dependent. Okay, because what our queries write, what uh, we write in for the queries are all depending on what database we're using. So we can say even though this is sort of independent at the source code level, because we just embed the SQL comments, we don't care what outside language is using, right? If we're embedding, then it doesn't matter we embed in Java, doesn't matter we embed in C or embed in Python, What's embedded in there looks the same, so it's independent on the source code level. But once it's compiled, it's not independent at the executable level, execution level. So, 
um, an alternative for embedding would be this. Okay. Rather than modifying the compiler, we can introduce a one more layer of abstraction between application and database management system. So we will spend some time talking about this today. Um, the first thing we can do will be to add drivers with database calls. Okay. So the drivers, the one taking care of communicating with the driver will be the API. Okay, so that's the application program interface we were talking about. So when using this approach, we have more uh, standardized interface. Okay? So because there's one more packaging in between for you, so you have more standardized way of communicating. And whatever the other side it is interacting with, you don't have to care. Okay, so that's what the API is for. So we can pass the SQL strings from language presents result sets in a language friendly way. So here are two um, more famous examples. So one will be um, ODBC, which stands for Open Database Connectivity, and another one which I think you guys are using, which is the JDE. Which teams are using JDBC? No one? I heard her. <laughs> okay, I just remember in the, in the project. You guys? We were. Oh, you changed it up. Yeah, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> so why? What was the reason? Um, originally, we intended to do our entire backend in Java, uh -huh. but we couldn't get the, uh, the server working. Oh. So then rather than just do like the database stuff in Java, we just switched over to Java. I see. <laughs> They're learning it today. Okay. Anyway, still a lot of people use JDBC. Um, so, okay. So these are just the two examples. Okay, for um, the alternative of embedded SQL. So because the API will already take care of communicating between what you write and what the database is. Okay, so we say this API approach is database independent. Okay, just compared to directly embedding the SQL language in your program. For this approach, let's take a look at how it actually works. Uh, yeah, I covered up very much. <laughs> so an application interacts with a data source. Uh, let me see. Uh, okay, so the API stands between the application and the data source. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is to select the data source. I want to quickly talk about what data source actually means. So when you first see data source, it seems more like where data is from, uh, like a data set, right? But actually here, the data source stands as data source stands for uh, what database you're using. That's it, okay? Because like we said earlier, um, you might be able to have your application run on different kinds of data databases, okay? So just do not confuse between the, the two words. So here, when we say to select a data, data source, just saying which database you want the application to interact with. Okay. So after you are sure about what data source you want to use, then um, a driver, corresponding driver, will be dynamically loaded. <coughs> so this is the part that's helping you out because uh, you can just write your program in one way, and different kinds of drivers will take care of translating what you write to suit different kinds of database. So you don't have to care. <laughs> All right. Then after the driver is selected, a connection will be established okay, with the data source. So this is what I want you guys to do this time, right? To have the connection established, as long as you can have the front end interact with the back end. Then, really easy, um, your SQL statements that you write will be translated and executed. Okay? Then, eventually, we just return the query result. So, just a couple of notes right here. Um, keep in mind that there is no limit on the number of open connections, okay? ideally. 
Um, so you can open as many um, number of connections you want. And this will also mean an application can have several open connections to different data sources. So remember last time when we were talking, this will be a, be a way from, a bit away from SQL. But last time we were talking about NoSQL and I, I think I remember someone was asking whether we can actually mix different kind of databases. So then I said, oh, you remember in Twitter, when we talk about Twitter, they actually both use NoSQL and SQL. Okay, so they combine it together. That's because your application can have multiple connections. Uh, with different kind of databases, which is kind of intuitive as well, right? You open a program and you can open different ports to connect with different um, databases. So, by having this, this allows you to have the ability of mixing different databases, different data sources in some sense, for your application. Okay. So, later in this chapter, um, what we will be focusing on will be JDBC. Okay. So we'll just use JDBC as an example for you to understand how this API approach works. So JDBC is not the only one, and now there's so much more than that, but we can just understand it from JDBC, starting from JDBC, so we will talk about what's the architecture of it. And then you can map this to some more modern ones. Okay. They actually have the same concept, but they're just dealing with different kind of databases or different kind of front-end um, technology right now. So the JDBC architecture actually has four parts. The first part we say just the application part. Okay. So when we talk about the JDBC, it's the whole thing. Okay, your application is in there as well. So for the application part, it takes care of establishing connections to the data source, which is um, uh, it takes care of initiating and terminating the connection. Okay. Which is really simple. In your application, you will have, definitely have one part saying here is where I want to connect to the database. Okay. And it will set the, uh, set the transaction boundaries and it will also take care of submitting the SQL statements. So whatever you do in the front end, you will have a way of converting it into the SQL statement you want. Right? Maybe you want to select the users or you want to just select all of the products or select products with certain categories and these will be the SQL commands you want to send in. And other components will take care of all the other work, and application also have to receive the results. Okay, and then you display them. So the second part will be driver manager. Remember, later on we will talk about driver. Right? Driver is one of the biggest part for the API approach. So for driver manager, uh, it is the one loading the JDBC driver. So we have different kinds of drivers that we will want to use, depends on the data sources. So driver manager is the one helping you out to pick the driver, so you don't have to care about it. Okay. So it doesn't matter what the driver is, the way you communicate with the API is the same. Okay. We make the same calls, but JDBC picks different drivers for you. So that saves a lot of um, effort. And driver manager will also pass and log the JDBC function calls to the correct drivers. Okay. So because we have driver manager, of course, we're going to have drivers. So we'll get into a bit more really quickly about the drivers. What the drivers are actually doing is to establish the connections to the data sources. Right? And it will transmit requests and return results and error codes. Error codes are the one we saw earlier in the example. Okay, what state it is in. Okay, so that's what the drivers would do. So imagine in different kinds of databases, earlier if we don't have um, API, maybe every different database have every different kinds of error code for the same error. Okay, but now driver, it will convert it for you. So you're, in your program, you can just look up in one uniform document, seeing okay when it's maybe 400, it's one meaning or some other code is one meaning. So you don't have to worry about what databases um, are talking about. Okay? And then we translate the results and error codes from a data source native form into JDBC standard. Then the very last component the JDBC also includes will be the data source. Okay? So the whole JDBC uh, wraps up the whole thing. So the data source, just think of it us the database that we use. Okay, so it processes commands from the driver and returns the results.
So we keep talking about driver, driver. So we can actually take a look into what drivers are there. Okay, what driver is first, and then what different types of drivers do we have. So here I think it looks a bit weird again. Uh, yeah. All right. So depending on the relative location of data source and application. That's how we have different kinds of drivers. So we will talk about these. There are four drivers right here, which are, um, the first one are, is bridges, and the second one is direct translation to native API via non-Java driver. The third one would be network bridges, and the fourth one will be direct translation to the native API via Java driver. Okay. So later on in your slides, you will see on the right, um, top right corner, I have a little database icon. Okay. So what I want you to do is to draw the rest. Okay, I'll show you what the rest looks like to show um, the concept of the driver. So let's talk about one by one. The first one is the bridge. So you can see right here, it's a bit small, but you can see the bridge right here. We're starting out with the app, okay, which is what you have. Okay, and the app sits on top of the JDBC. And here's just an example. It doesn't have to be ODBC, but JDBC sits on ODBC, and then we connect to the database. So what is actually happening here? So for the first type of drivers, where we call them the bridges, so they translate the JDBC function calls into function calls of another API that is not native to the database management system. Okay. So what we are saying right here is, that's an example we have. Okay, so imagine the driver is a driver between JDBC and ODBC. So you actually write your application in a way that you are thinking about this is going to be for the JDBC for the Java, and then the driver takes in, take care of translating from one API to another API. Okay, so then. Um, because maybe your database is actually for ODBC. So that's what this kind of bridge type is doing. So the advantage right here is that it's easy to piggyback to the application onto an existing installation. Okay, so for example, today you already have some other types that you want to use, but you don't want to install it. So then you can just use this bridge type. You don't install another. Let's say you don't want to install ODBC. Okay, then the driver can take care of it. But as you can imagine, this doesn't sound that smart, right? You're just from one API to another API. And API still sits on top of something else, right? AT API still wraps up other um, more bottom part app, uh, functions. So the disadvantages here will be like, uh, increase, increase the numbers of layers between data source and application, of, and that would affect the performance, okay? So for example, you can imagine today, um, let me see. For example, you, we want to get data from Twitter, and have any one of you tried crawling data from Twitter? So Twitter, they provide an API, okay, also an application programming interface, that you can actually write a program and then um, specify, say, from this moment on, I want to collect all of the tweets that is being tweeted right now, including what string, okay? But Twitter is sneaky, they will only give you 1% of it. But if you do that, <laughs> so there are researchers, this is off the topic, but there are researchers trying to see whether there is any way if they use enough computers to hack it, and then they can get like so many of the 1% and get it all. And apparently it's not possible. I don't know what Twitter does behind it, but they just don't let people do to collect all of the data at that moment. Okay. But anyway, so Twitter API is a very powerful tool because it's impossible for yourself, almost impossible, you can still break it, but it's almost impossible for you to collect all of the tweets happening at this moment, right? Like we are talking, there are so many tweets being tweeted right now. So Twitter, they apply, uh, they offer this API for you to use. So you can imagine today, maybe you think, okay, Twitter API is kind of hard to learn. So you found on GitHub, someone else is writing another API on top of Twitter API saying this will be more intuitive. 
Okay? So then you write a program, connect to the third party API, which connects to the Twitter API, and Twitter then connects to their database management system. Imagine that's not the smartest way. Okay? So this is kind of the, what the bridge is doing. But maybe it's a lazy way because you just don't want to think. Maybe quick implementation but slow performance. Okay? That's type one bridge. The second type we call direct translation to the native API via non-Java drive. So here you can see that's what we have right here. Also starting from the application we have right here. In our application, again, it sits on top of JDBC, which is the same thing throughout the all four types because we're talking about different types of drivers of JDBC. Then, JDBC sits on top of a database API. So what do you mean by this? So for this type, this type of drivers, it actually translates JDBC function calls directly into method invocations of the API of one specific data source. So you can imagine sometimes the database itself will provide you with some API. Even though it's not written, maybe not written in Java, if your application is running Java. So the advantage of it is that most of the time, if the database is going to implement an API, okay, they will implement it in a way that's the most optimized. Way. And they might be able to use C or C++ and a mixture of Java to speed it up. Okay? But the disadvantage of it will be that database driver that implements the API needs to be installed on each computer that runs the application. So for example, if today your application actually has, um, has to run on multiple computers, then they will all need to install this. Okay? Sometimes they, they be, that becomes an overhead. So that's why this will lead to the third approach. If we don't want to install all of the computers <coughs> with the database API. Then we can actually use a network bridge. Okay. So you can see right here, imagine this as um, all of the computers. Can you guys see? I'm just doing my own thing here and you guys can't see. But imagine the left side, okay, the, the application in JDBC is on each computer. Okay? Then we actually have a connect right there. You can see in the middle part, we have the middleware. That's the JDBC with the ODBC. And you can imagine it as a server, right? So we have the local part just connect to the server. So how this approach is doing is that the driver talks over a network to a middleware server that translates the JDBC request into database uh, management system specific method invocation. So instead of having um, the driver sitting on each computer, you just have it sitting maybe in the car, okay, in the server. So the driver on the client side then is not database uh, management system specific. So it doesn't really care about okay, what the database is. And because the whole thing, the more important part now, is being taken care of by the server, so whatever you need to put on the clients, okay, the, the each the computer side, it's a, a lot smaller. Okay. And the reason, okay, again, the reason we can have it so small is because um, for the little driver we have on the clients, the only needs they only needs to implement functions for sending SQLs to the server. So in, in, in terms of understanding the SQL commands and have the queries returned back from the database, that'll be taken care of in the server, okay, in, in the cloud. Okay, finally, the very last approach we have, it's just a bit different from the second, uh, the second approach. It's the direct translation to the native API via the Java drive. So earlier it was a non-Java one, here it's a Java. So, um, how the driver actually communicates with the database management system is through the Java sockets. Okay. So you can see right there we have the application sitting on top of JDBC and the JDBC talks through um, Java sockets with the database. 
and earlier you saw, um, I know you guys couldn't really color it, but earlier in the second one, we have the DB API in orange, but here it's blue, because that means they're actually written in the same language. Okay. So, driver on the client side is written in Java in, oh, that means they are database management, system specific. So the driver in this type, it translates JDBC calls into the native API of the database system. Okay. So that was all of the types for the driver. Okay. So then, when you are working on your project, you can think about what happens in your technology. Okay. How you can map it to what you are using for your project. So, um, you have three minutes left. <coughs> Let me think. Um, yeah, so for the teams that haven't demonstrated the demos, I think it will be taking place today and tomorrow. Okay? So just make sure I think you guys will meet uh, Yin Jing at 337. And I might be there, I might not be there, so I'll come in and out, but she will definitely be there. And um, for office hour today, I'll have to move it to two to three. Okay, if you're planning to come later, I have to move it to two to three, and I'll send out an email later as well. So that's it for today. Okay, I'll see you guys on Friday.